Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Giacomo and I'm the ambassador for Product Management Festival in Berlin. And uh, I would like to welcome you tonight with uh, the schedule of, the, of our, uh, let's say, conf of our call. And today we're going to speak about how to transition to product leadership in 12 months. So the agenda is as follow. I will give a brief introduction about uh, myself, about, uh, about our guests, and I will spend a couple of words about what's uh, PMF, Product Management Festival. And then we will uh, have some time uh, after the speech, we will have some time at the end for questions, which I invite you to ask during the, the speech. We will collect all of them, and then we will try to, to address at the end as many as possible. Um, so our guests tonight speaking about how to transition to product leadership are uh, Katia or Katerina, uh, that's uh, known as Katia so far, and Daniel. Um, they are both um, founder of co-founder of Head of Product and both product coach. And um, yeah, they are going to talk about how to transition to product leadership tonight. And um, about PMF. So PMF is a community of product manager um, that does a lot of stuff, among which obviously product management nights, uh, like the one you're participating at the moment. And we have it uh, globally, so all around the world. And the nice thing is that at the moment, many of them are online. So you can participate, participate also to um, PM nights that are not necessarily in your country. So as we saw tonight, we have people from Barcelona, Denmark, um, Zurich and Berlin, obviously. So that's really cool. Um, but you might have heard about Product Management Festival because of the festival itself, uh, which is held in Zurich and in Singapore. And uh, so we have basically two conferences um, every year. And um, yeah, so in, they are usually around September, November or June. And um, one cool thing about the uh, Product Management Festival is the PM report, which is a super comprehensive report with a lot of information about the product manager and the product management world um, uh, and which are the trends, let's say, in, uh, in our job and for the product uh, to C-suite, which is a path to an executive program of five days. So this is a little bit uh, PMF. And this is me, and uh, we, all, we have also Dora, so I'm Giacomo, obviously, and I'm a product manager at Olex, a classified uh, website in Eastern Europe and Portugal, and also PMF ambassador for Berlin. Um, together with me, the other ambassador is Dora, and she's a technical product manager at also. And... So a little bit of housekeeping before getting started. The event, uh, as I mentioned, is recorded. So you, yeah, you will you, you will receive also the records at uh, later on. And uh, yeah, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, you can um, close your you can leave the camera off. But obviously, I invite you to leave it on uh, in order to be more engaged um, with the with the speech. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, all the questions can be written in the chat. We will collect them and then we will answer them at the end of the speech. And in the meantime, please, I see everyone is already muted. So no need to say to mute yourself. Um, so that's pretty much uh, it. Uh, one last, last thing, we are always looking for speakers and if you have something uh, interesting to say related to product management, obviously, uh, feel free to reach me out on uh, LinkedIn, again, I'm Giacomo Giorgiani, and uh, we can talk about it or just reach the product management festival and then they will uh, readdress, uh, forward your, um, um, like your speech, uh, you're willing to participate to me. So that's it on my side. Uh, uh, now I leave the stage to our lovely guests and uh, they will probably can introduce, give also a bit of an introduction better than what I could have done. So stage is yours. Thank you so much, Giacomo. Let me start sharing the screen.
and you should be able to see that. So welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about the product leadership and how to transition. This is a part of the content that we have developed together with Katya as a framework that helps individual contributors, people like senior PMs or regular PMs or lead PMs to actually transition into the leadership role, which has a different title across different um, places. It could be head of product, could be group PM, could be director level. So that's really depends on the company. Today, we're going to start with a small introduction about ourselves and mention the, the framework uh, that we're going to discuss. It has the first chapter of laying the foundation who is the product manager who's a product leader what they do how they operate we're going to talk about the framework as well which is based on complexities and we're going to cover three types of those which is a stakeholder complexity domain complexity and people complexity and of course a time for questions and answers um, to give you a preview that this framework is a part of a bigger educational course that we have developed so we are doing this uh, course this webinar with PMF to share some of the content which is universal and cannot be applied by yourself. So we hope that you find it helpful, but also there will be an opportunity for you to learn more about it. We're going to have a slide at the end that describes how you can get the rest of the framework and practical examples and exercises and self-assessment tools to go about it and really be in a more control of your career growth as a product manager. So with that, let's start and introduce ourselves. I'll go first as I'm already speaking and I'm Daniel. I'm working right now full-time as a head of product and growth at TIER, which is a mobility startup. And probably you have seen the scooters in some of the cities if you're definitely in Berlin, but um, still not in um, across all of the Europe, but we operate in 170 cities, I think right now. The company is a unicorn with a 2 billion valuation. And we have around 20 product teams and different levels of leadership and management from like junior leadership to very senior and executive level. So I've been there for two years, leading several teams in the growth area. And on top of that, I have my private business or hobby, so to say, where I coach other PMs. I help them develop missing skills or transition to a new career or maybe uh, improve their relationship with a stakeholder that is key to their success. And also for public speaking workshops and webinars, because I like product management a lot. I think it's a really cool profession. So I gladly share what I learned along the way. And TIER is such an exciting place with so many things happening at the same time. So that it's a lot of information, a lot of uh, food for thought. So I'm gladly doing that on LinkedIn and during those meetups or like today, for example. With that, I will pass it to Katya. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Katya. I do show up on LinkedIn and some of the official sites is Katarina Suchkova, but I usually go by Katya. So really good to see everyone. Um, I've been in product for over 10 years um, and really tr tried almost everything, B2B, B2C, um, enterprise, hyper growth startups. Um, but my sweet spot um, turned out to be really just B2B and in particular enterprise um, setting. My last full-time job was um, leading um, a group of uh, remote product managers at 15.5 um, a year ago. Since then, I moved on to become a full-time coach. Um, I've been kind of coaching and mentoring for a few years now, but um, the the desire and um, just the, the passion of helping product managers sharing what I've learned and making sure that, um, you know, you don't uh, step or make the same mistakes as I have really led me to full-time coaching. So today I work with individual PMs, uh, with PMs who are trying to transition to leadership. That's the so another sweet spot where I found myself, given that I've transitioned to leadership a couple of years ago and realize how difficult it is and how ambiguous um, and really not clear the journey might be. So this talk, as well as the course that Daniel mentioned, is really, you know, something that I personally, I wish uh, I've attended, I've taken um, a few years ago when I was at that transitional phase. And I think with that, I'm just going to pass back to you, Daniel, to kick us off with the actual presentation, and then we'll go from there. All right, uh, we have the official timeline to wrap up by 7 p.m. Central European time, which is 15 minutes only. We're probably gonna go overboard. So uh, if you stay with us, we have a present for you from me and Katya. We're gonna have a raffle that you can participate in at the end of the 
webinar, which will be a free giveaway, one coaching session with Katya and another one with me. You're free to pick who, with whom you would like to uh, have a session. It's going to be one hour. And please stay until the end if you can. We're going to explain how you can participate and share the secret link for you to do that. So let's start. Um, product manager versus product leader. A majority of people in the PMF community are probably product managers. So we know that this is our profession. We've been doing this for a really long time. But to just summarize how we see it from our perspective, that PMs really focus on the depth of the problem in front of them, which could be their scope. And they answer the questions of who is doing what and when things are being done. And that's basically involving the managing of the team, doing some research and discovery, translating this into delivery, and starting to work a little bit on roadmaps and short-term strategy. Depending on seniority, you could be not working on roadmaps or working a lot, or maybe only on them. So that's a borderline that gets you closer to the leadership position. And of course, to be efficient as a product manager, we need to do so many things at the same time. And I would like to ask you in the chat, what do you think from your perspective, maybe your personal experience are the most important skills or qualities that help you be a successful product manager? So could you please share a few things in the chat could be a long list, could be just one uh, word. Either ways go, and we'll see what people think and if that overlaps or not. Okay, here we go. Prioritization, communication, and stakeholder management. For sure. I think all of the answers are going to be spot on. So product sense. Okay, Giacomo, thank you. Empathy. We're going to hear uh, and talk a lot about empathy during this talk. What else? It's interesting that nobody's writing like creating good tickets in Jira or having a nice uh, timelines because that, that's not really the key to the profession. As you see, it's more about like say stakeholder management, communications, empathy, curiosity, very well said, Natalia. I think it drives a lot of us professionally. So solving problems, intuition, all those th skills that are actually not about how you go and do your daily work. So conflict management, also relationship building. That's a super, super important. When it comes to product leaders, they have a slightly different focus. And that's definitely an evolution of a product manager because product manager is already a very local leader and you're leading a team already. And I think, Katya, since you have this focus on product leadership and you claim that you have been found the sweet spot, why don't you talk a little bit about product leaders and take this chapter? Sounds good. So the, the way I'm thinking about product leadership, kind of based on my own experiences, uh, while the product managers, the individual contributors tend to focus on the depth, right? We kind of go into this tunnel vision. We get really good at what we do. We become experts. Uh, product leaders, it's really focusing on the width, width of problems, width of addressing, working with audience, as well as setting the vision and the goal. So the analogy that um, resonates with many and it kind of worked for me is imagine that when you and I see, all you see is what um, is under the water, right? So you become really good at um, underwater diving, you see all the fish, you see kind of like you, you can see 360. Um, and the product leader um, is actually what happens above the water. So that transition is really all about um, taking, uh, taking yourself up and finally looking at 360 horizon so that you can see, oh, we're actually on a big ship and the ship is going Northwest. Um, and I see also other competitors, right? Other ships, maybe dolphins, other uh, marine life that actually exists above the water. So that, from that perspective of that analogy, you really start thinking, um, how do people on your team, and when I say a team, when you're product leader, it's really not just your product team, it's really our R&D team. It's the team, um, the UX research, the engineers, the designers, and product marketers. Uh, those who interact with you the most, how do these teams actually work together? Uh, what processes or frameworks or approaches can you create to help facilitate achieving the goal? Not the processes for the sake of processes, but something that to make something more effective. And you also start really paying attention to long-term strategy. While in IC issues, you really were all about, you know, maybe quarter, maximum a year roadmap, 
as a product leader, as a director of GPM, you're really looking at um, at least a year, um, ideally three years and longer. And you get really good at creating, or you should get really good at creating the vision and empowering your team with the strategy and goals that kind of cascading down and make sure that whatever your team is working on is directly contributing the customers and the business. Um, and the, finally, it's not just about the direct target audience that you're working with, you're also serving as a product leader, business um, and its bottom line, as well as the investors. And from, from this perspective, um, I'm actually curious, what do you think are the um, qualities or the top skills for a product leader? And again, it could be GPM, it could be a director of product management, or um, you know, maybe you just don't have a title yet, but you already exhibit those leadership skills. Um, so really curious to hear your answers. You can do the same, just type in the chat. And uh, we'll see what you're going to come up with. We had some good answers for product managers. Let's see what comes up for a product leader. And maybe think about someone, if you have a good manager, maybe you have a good role model, maybe a mentor. What qualities have you seen in them that for you embody that product leadership? Oh, I love that, Natalia. Ability to empower. Oof, that's, that one is really good one trust inclusivity right marina so that it's really creating the inclusive environment deliver vision mm -hmm. that's the ability also to empower perhaps with a vision so that your people can um, go work towards their goals inspiration and direction expectations management right oh so much i think you know all the answers are you're just right, right? Because there's just so many things we have to get good at. And looks like, um, you know, from the list that I'm seeing right now, majority of those items are um, more, you know, we, we would call them soft skills, right? So I have, I don't see any hard skills here, which is another point for becoming a product leader is fostering your emotional intelligence and your social, um, your soft skills. I'm going to... Um, pause here and then uh, Daniel would you like to take the next chapter to actually kind of start talking about our framework and uh, dive deeper to to give participants yeah some action items to take next week yeah let's do that so we came up with the so this is the from the theory on paper people who are product leaders should be inclusive deliver vision inspire others and empower but that's all good and and very fine uh, how does it work on practice? What are the things that are applicable to our daily job? And we developed this framework, we call it a complexity framework that indicates how a product leader can act and perform, what's their mindset, and how can you start operating in this mindset and already start to behave and act as a product leader, maybe without waiting for this director title or a group product manager. And basically, if you look at any product area, with time, you receive new stuff there. You get new learnings, you get new customers and teams, something changes on the strategy, you enter a new market, a competitor is doing something, people join the company or leave the company, new products get launched. All that is new information that gets into your area or domain. And they, of course, increase the complexity that is there. Things become more entangled, they start to be uh, dependable on each other, and it's not hard to navigate this space. So the framework that we apply to the product leadership, they, they still have a full-time job, and it's not just about you know, speaking and being a powerful leader and being in front of people. They actually do a lot of work, and that work is to reduce those complexities. They take something that exists, and it's really difficult to either use or apply or it makes the work very complicated and they disentangle it. They take it apart. They put it in a process. They give it back to the teams and they focus on reducing those complexities. And we have found three different types of those complexities or buckets that definitely exist in a lot of organizations. And there are ways how you can reduce and manage them. Today, we're going to explain the, the highlights of this framework so that you can probably understand, oh, I know this is happening in my organization. This is definitely true. And maybe start noticing that and doing something about it. Of course, 
there are many different techniques and ways in which order we can do this and like specific, let's say guidelines, but one webinar is too short to explain everything. So we'll just cover the top and maybe you can take it with you. And the first complexity or the bucket of complexities is definitely a stakeholder complexity. We all have stakeholders and stakeholder management and inclusion is a very important skill, as you said in the chat. And when you have stakeholder complexity, this is what you usually feel. Uh, when you don't have clear priorities or stakeholders all want different things and you have to really manage them and their expectations and you make decisions, but they also make decisions and you make those decisions separately. And everyone is requesting features because they needed to promise someone to reach something. And it looks like a feature factory and nobody is owning and being accountable for those things. And the team doesn't have a lot of trust or autonomy. And this is how you feel when you have a stakeholder complexity. Maybe if you have multiple stakeholders and they come from different departments departments and they have different influence and seniority, this is the situation that is a stakeholder complexity that could be reduced by a product leader or a person with good product leadership skills. And maybe you have identified yourself. So we know that when this stakeholder complexity exists, you can generally do layer of methods to reduce it. And we have here highlighted three most important ones that worked really well from our experience. And this is of course to increase the transparency and the flow information is to change the stakeholder management into stakeholder inclusion. And of course, to develop the accountability either for the teams, but also for stakeholders, because if they come with ideas and they really request a specific feature with specific requirements, they probably know something and they should be accountable for it equally as you because you deliver quality, but they deliver the idea and the promise. And it's unfair if they deliver the promise, but you are accountable for the result. It's just not really working. So I can give you an example from my experience when I had a stakeholder complexity at tier and what we did there. So I was working in the monetization area, which at tier means that we are offering subscriptions and different pricing models in a city. As I said, we operate in 170 cities. So we have 170 different pricing models and subscription models. They are sometimes very similar, but still different markets have different needs and they depend like France from Germany are two completely different markets. And we have representatives from those markets who are saying, I need this campaign, I need this feature, I need this integration and so on. It was really difficult to navigate because all of them said really important things. They were all really um, loud and uh, affirmative and it was and assertive as well, and we needed to navigate it somehow. So what we did there back then is to or we organized a group with a biweekly call. It was for one hour at the beginning, and then um, became a 90-minute call where we invited all product managers of this area, all stakeholders who have any requests, and we called it a forum where we would discuss our progress and would discuss our KPIs and then make decisions together. We created a space where everyone was roughly equal in their demands and they were able to see the whole list of requests that we receive. Before that, they thought that it was super simple to implement and they're on the only market that are requesting something. We increased the transparency of all that. We included all the stakeholders and say, okay, let's all make decisions. We have a capacity of three product teams, in total 20 people. What should they be doing? Let's decide together. You all know what's on the table and that is a, was a tool how we developed this accountability. And I can tell you that after three months and one quarter, we had an amazing result and relationship with stakeholders. They came with requests that were prioritized, aligned to customer needs. They needed the impact. They did their homework and they understood what our uh, needs from the product perspective were. And it really improved the, the, the relationship with them. And it improved the mood and the culture. And people started to, I don't know, have jokes and laugh around about things, although it's a serious business, but it just was a different conversation. And, you know, having this shared space really, really helped us to develop this and reduce this compl uh, stakeholder complexity. So when it comes to the second complexity, I'm going to hand it over to Katya. Thank you, Daniel. So the second one, think about this theme as um, problem, your problem domain complexity. Um, so we, when we say problem, it's really, you know, your area of focus, um, you know, whatever product you're working on. And I'll give you an example um, or kind of story from my, from my experience. So when I joined 15.5, 
um, early in 2019, um, the team really had only a couple of product managers. So the, um, for me to obtain the knowledge, um, even about my um, squad or the couple of squads that I was responsible for was um, I had to talk with people. Um, and it's, of course, it's great for relationship building, um, but I understood that the knowledge was really living within a few, a few people. Um, so the, one of the first projects um, that I led together with my peers was to figure out how do we actually bring the knowledge in one place? How do we create in a way a process out of the knowledge so that when a new product manager that we hire, um, they don't have to talk with me anymore. They don't have to talk with other product managers that can go ahead uh, quickly and, and kind of catch up on the knowledge um, go to, by going to wikis. We, that's what we did. We just used Quip at that time and created a bunch of, you know, the um, success center in a way. And it was a, um, a big initiative uh, because the support was writing a few things. I was writing a few things, engineers, um, customers, customer success. So it wasn't just, you know, uh, one person sitting down and doing that. And for the, uh, that problem complexity, also um, the symptoms that you might experience um, could be really um, you know, besides feeling like you have to reach for knowledge to actual people, or you feel like there is a dependency before your team can implement something, they need to go um, to another team. Other symptoms can be um, uncontrollable scope. Let's say you start with a very defined problem. You kind of know that this is what you're working on. And then suddenly by the time your discovery is done, um, the scope has grown. Um, there is also a lower quality of your releases. You might feel that. You might feel like there is just low ownership and redundancy on the team that's happening, as well as complicated onboarding, kind of the example that I gave you. Um, another example with um, weak product results um, was at uh, ServiceNow when we, the company was also growing and was B2B enterprise. Um, the, we've noticed that the quality of all of our releases really started going down. And one way to solve that was to actually um, split the problem areas because one of some of our product managers had more that they can consume, more than they can actually discover or just deal with. So the project was to, instead of bringing synergy and combining a few problem areas, it was actually splitting up so that product managers could focus on much more targeted problem. So those are a couple of examples for the um, problem complex or problem domain complexity. And uh, Daniel will cover the last complexity bucket that we have for you. Okay, so do you want to take this slide or? Yes, thank you. Um, okay. So the, to kind of summarize all of the themes for that, right, is really start thinking about fundamentals. And fundamentals, again, are just all about um, the knowledge, what's missing, um, what could help you and your people to onboard faster, what could help reduce dependency and redundancy. And then take all the knowledge that you have, your team might have in their head and turn it into knowledge. Could be Wiki, Success Center, partner it up with other departments uh, to tackle the big problem. And the final one is really all about over communication. This is one of my favorite because since we all moved into the remote world, um, you know, we, I personally don't use email that much, but even with Slack, we don't tend to communicate enough. So my motto is over communicate, especially when it comes to my team members, um, maybe give them context, create the context so that they know what to expect. And Daniel, you can take over. Thank you. Yeah. One also comment from my side that I really like this turn knowledge into process because when you have just information or knowledge, it's all good. It's very helpful, but you should use the knowledge. You should use it to make decisions and decisions should make sense and follow the same logic. So that's a process. And if you have knowledge as data, for example, it's good to build a KPI tree and understand how KPIs are relating to each other and then use them to make specific decisions. And then your product performance or your domain will have less complexity and more clarity. So this is a thing that you can, I, I really, really like this one of turning the knowledge and information outside of the, like from people's heads or from data into something that can be usable. It's a, it's a practical transformation. The third type of complexities, and by the way, those complexities, they are really 
very close to each other. We, of course, name them and separate it because if you have a name, it's easy to deal with them, but sometimes they are quite similar. So it's also okay because complexities, they're not a very nice thing. They come in all shapes and sizes and they're sometimes or entangled between each other as well. But the third one is about the people complexity. It's your teams and who are working on with your product team, which could be a uh, cross-functional uh, team with the developers and designers. It could be your main partners in research or data. And sometimes things are not really working well there and you have a people complexity. So it feels like nobody is owning anything or you don't have enough resources and you always need to beg for data analytics time and they are busy with their own priorities and you never have their support or there are people who just um, have a lot of knowledge information and they like to know everything. They like to be in the center of attention and answer questions and they don't really share the information and like, it's it's a silo instead of a, a group dynamic that you have vision that is there or maybe not there or it's unclear and people cannot connect to this vision and when they can't connect they don't feel really energized and it means their motivation is low they have random productivity and accountability is also not there so all those things that uh like when people are feeling like there's a not a team but rather a collection of random individuals in one place it is a feeling that you might have when you have a people complexity. And usually you can also have a mix right now, especially in the remote world, where you have people, some are working from the office, some are working from home, from another city, some are contractors and freelancers, some are already leaving the team and they are moving on to their next journey. And all that complicates things. And when you see that, you can also reduce it as a product leader. And there are of course, different ways to do that. So um, the the most popular one, I would say, is to develop the vision itself. I think for me, it's clear that the vision is a, is a key part. This is that what aligns people. This is what they can understand and repeat to others. So from my side, I would say developing this is... Um, uh, the fir a very first good step. You can do this together with the team. You can do it by yourself. And the only thing that you, if you do it alone, you still need to get the buy-in from the team. And if you have a people complexity, it's very good to involve the team in all those activities. Same goes for goals and the KPIs or the quarterly results that you want to hit or you want to do that. And once you have those goals, it's really important to celebrate when you achieve them. And when you have problems and you don't achieve them, not to take it super personally, but to learn from that. And again, turn this information and knowledge into the process and maybe change something in your previous thinking. So when you have this um, frameworks or processes that you improve, maybe you focus on retrospectives. Maybe you start building a team dynamic and start doing some kind of virtual events. Maybe you introduce buddy program or mentorship all those things that build the team and make them feel like one unit is super, super helpful to improve the people's situation and reduce the team complexity. And to be honest, it doesn't have to be the team that you have in your area, your developers or a designer. It could be also people outside of your team. It could be partners from support or maybe sales. And you can make your team even more cross-functional if you invite them and say, hey, let's go and hang out together. Let's have a Friday checkout at 5 p.m. and we all grab a silly hat and a drink. We do it once a month and we just talk to each other. And it doesn't have to be all about work. People are very interesting emotional creatures and it's important to activate those emotions and then they open up a little bit and they start to collaborate because if you have a fun time as a people, you probably also want to keep up doing that while you have professional time as a team. So aligning them, introducing goals, like those are the tools and methods you can use. Of course, which one to use depends really on your situation, but that's the, uh, the, the things that we found really working from our experience. And this is the third time type and the last type of complexities that appear in the product space. So the takeaway that we want you to have once you leave this uh, presentation is to really understand that you don't need to wait for the title to start acting like a product leader. It is starting with you. You're already a leader. You already lead a team of developers or designers without being their manager. So local level, but still a leader. And that's your mindset. That's your actions. And if you need a practical toolkit, you can use this complexity framework and find the one that 
is the most present or the one that you can tackle. You don't need to do all of them. Just pick one that is closest to you and you know what to do there and start working on it. Introduce a, a project, how you change the team dynamic or start a wiki building project. And it's going to help. It's going to improve things. And you can do that in eight to 10 weeks. It's not a long time. So once you start and identify that, we really, really recommend to partner with someone because product managers are overloaded with work very often. And if you get support and buy-in and recognition, that's going to help. So find the buddy, find the manager, ask them to support you and say that, yes, I would like to dedicate, I know, three hours every week to, to that or half a day. And maybe find a, a partner or a peer who will do it together with you. And maybe they will be from the engineering side or maybe they could be from commercial side or operations. That would be a very interesting combination. And then you already start to develop the stakeholder inclusion and you start solving the problem together and that bonds people. So those are the steps that we recommend. And of course, you can start already tomorrow and use this framework. And over time, as you get more experience, you can handle more complex uh, complexities or you can handle several of them in parallel, which is also an easy framework to use and repeat, but as you know, that's just a framework. And what we mentioned at the very beginning that going through that is difficult, especially if you don't have experience or you don't have a good product leader or a senior like executive in the team, change overall is quite hard because you might not know which change you should start from, in which order to introduce those new processes, how to lead them, what people to engage and how to uh, collaborate with your team what should be the projects, which things, if, if they work, you should keep. If they don't work, you need to understand why they don't work. So all that is not, not an easy task to be, to be sure. So we, we shared this framework with you. And I said in the beginning that this is part of our course for product leadership. So we would like to invite you to participate in that. And if you want to really get and develop the full understanding of this complexity framework, and you found that it's helpful for you, and you recognize that this is a, something that you already have and like, I have a complexity with my stakeholders, let's say, we have built a career program where you can develop more skills to handle those complexities. It will be super, super practical that you can take this complexity and actually improve it and manage it on your, uh, your actual job. So we invite you to participate. We have a small discount for you for uh, everyone who is signing up until end of next week. We start really, really soon. We have, I think, two places left only, and we're going to start on the calendar week 10, which is 28th of February or the first week of March. That's the, uh, the same week. And you can go to the website, apply, learn more. And if you win a coaching session with me or Katya, you can also ask all of the questions personally and don't hesitate to reach on, uh, on LinkedIn or any other places. And speaking about the giveaway. So to participate, we would like to ask you to send us your feedback because this is the product way and feel feedback is a gift. So please extend it to us. It's a small survey. It has only three questions. And uh, here is the link in the chat. Thank you, Katja. You can also use your phone and point it to the QR with your camera app. So it will pop up from the top. You're going to see a small bar that it wants to open a web page. So that's the same link. And you can do this right away or you can do it a little bit later. So we will do this raffle. Uh, tomorrow. So let's say that you have 24 hours to do that. And those people who participate will be randomly, um, we'll pick two random people and send them a, a gift as a free coaching session. So that was the end. And thank you so much for staying with us. Now we have some time for questions and answers. And shoot, either unmute yourself and speak or just type them in the chat and we're going to take it through there. So maybe I can. I would just quickly want to jump in and uh, thank you for the for the speech. It was very inspiring and like made me think about like how I can relate what uh, what with what you said and like what's happening in my current company. And uh, I could completely understand like especially I could relate it with the last part um, like with the people management and like process management product complexity I'm sorry complexity people complexity and um, like about acting on on that um, I think that like the best takeaway uh, 
it's basically about the leadership and in my opinion one another important thing to mention is like the ownership itself like to really feel like you're owning something and it's once you identify complexity if you feel like you're owning your space your scope and you might want to go also beyond that then yeah i think like i felt like this this um, sense of ownership and that helped me uh, identifying one complexity that in my case was uh, messy documentation and uh, messy product documentation and working on that and setting some kind of standards that then also inspired other people other product managers in let's say my area so that was i could relate a lot with that and that shows um yeah how you can with small steps um solve uh, some some complexity and maybe also inspire others in that sense yeah and i have a small very practical advice how you can start with that if you have this complexity with the knowledge and the product itself just Find a person who also suffers from that and have a coffee chat with them for half an hour and 45 minutes and have an honest conversation saying, hey, I feel like it's really, really hard to find the answers. Everything is everywhere and nothing is anywhere. Do you feel the same? And if they say yes and they share, like say, okay, I would like to fix it. Would you like to help me? I'm really done with it. I want to make this better. And that is the same with the stakeholders. If you go and find, hey, I feel like the relationship in this area, it's not just me and you, it's like the whole setup is not really optimal. We argue often, we find it takes 45 minutes to reach a simple decision. I think there is something wrong and I want to make it better. What do you think? Do you feel the same as well? And you start to, you have this honest conversation, same with the team and say, hey, what do you think we should do? And maybe they will join, maybe say, oh, I don't have time, but you should talk to Lauren and you, she's, she knows what to do. And you find the person who is the second person with you and you just do something about it. And it could be very small and it doesn't have to be grand and super awesome. And you don't definitely need to rush to fix uh, the problems of other people if they don't believe in those problems. You should really get their buy-in and it all starts with the conversation and asking the question, okay, I feel like we have some issue of friction here. Do you feel the same? And then go from that. And maybe together we'll come up with this, uh, with a plan to improve it over time. And it doesn't take much time. You need a couple of hours every week, several weeks, and things will be noticeably better. And something else to add, um, since we don't have any questions, but I, uh, we've heard that one a lot. I personally heard it a lot with my, um, with, with my clients. So like every time I share the framework, um, the follow-up question is, so how do I actually um, take that? What are my actual next steps for implementing something like that? Um, and something in one of the takeaways, Daniel mentioned partner with someone, you know, allocate three hours. That sounds great, right? But how do we find those, how do we find those three hours in our super busy PM day? And in my, in my experience, what worked well is really starting with number one, uh, do inventory of your calendar. Um, PMs are so busy and so many meetings that we have, um, they're very, like, we don't have to be there. And we are there because it's a default, because we feel like the world uh, kind of goes around us, right? Which is not, you know, but when you become in a, that, that mindset change is going from IC to product leader is really understand it's not about you anymore. It's going to be about projects, going to be about team. So take a look at your calendar. That's really number one and see what can you say no to? What decision making can you delegate? Um, can you empower your engineering manager, your design manager to own some aspects of your, um, of your meeting? Um, can they just check in with you later? And I'm pretty sure you're gonna find at least a few, and this is how you might create those three hours in your day, in your, I'm sorry, in your week, because those three hours are the, exactly the time that you would want to use for a bigger um, initiative for the high visibility project. And the second, go talk with your manager. If you can't figure out which meetings you need to attend, where do you need to be, what decision in decisions you have to be making, partner up with your manager, talk with them, explain that this is, I want to become a leader, but I need time. I cannot be in my day-to-day -day squad every day because I'm still underwater. I cannot see what's above. So ask them for help to deprioritize some things off your plate. And after that, it's really just, as I mentioned the question before, take a look at everything. Like if you're familiar with the opportunity tree of Teresa Torres, 
same framework or same approach can be applied to finding complexities. Map them out, see what you can come up with. And after that, it's all about you taking an action, as Daniel mentioned, partnering up with other people from different departments and really uh, leading something significant because you want to create an impact. So think about 80, 20. How might you create that impact with the initiative that you're leading? Thank you, Katya. And we have a question in the chat from Patricia that over communication, or maybe Patricia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it personally? Yeah. Hi, sure, I can do that. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and I can relate to a lot what I heard. Um, over communication is something I'm especially interested in because um, we're also doing a lot, a big project right now in our company. And I, I really learned that communicating a lot helps to work independently. They leave like they leave us do. But the problem is that um, in such a big company and with so many different stakeholders, um, there's so many different communication tools and ways. Uh, it tends to really overboard and uh, it takes up a lot of my time. And I just wonder if you have strategies or tips uh, how to do. I mean, I can, we have a blog, for example, that also, uh, or, or how can I put it, that helps. So we don't have to reach the broader stakeholders, but it's still complicated. You have Slack with the engineering team, you have teams with the broader stakeholder teams. Uh, you have the steering board, you need to communicate differently. All these problems that appear, that would be interesting for me to know. And it's exactly like you described. You have, yeah. and, and this is my, would be a recommendation as well. I have this uh, a template three on three, like a matrix. And the first column is a group of stakeholders. So I split it into senior leadership team, everyone in the company or investors or partners and identify what is the group. The second one, I identify how often I would like to talk to this group and at which places. And it could be different things for different groups. It could be in the blog, could be a video message, could be a slide deck, could be a meeting, could be a text, could be whatever the medium you find. And also like, okay, which way and how often? And the third column is to write down what I want them to get away from this meeting. So what they should understand, what is their motivation? Do they need high level update? Do they need financial numbers? Do they need recognition? And do they need some kind of reassurance or clarity? What is their need? And this is my product market fit with an audience. And I try to fill it with different lines of stakeholders. So maybe I have three or four of them. And then that's my setup from the beginning. After that, it's really important to have this reason that when you communicate, it's not random, it happens weekly, bi-weekly, every month, every quarter, depending on the stakeholder, it's always the same time and people get used to that and they start feeling this is a part of their life and it's like a rhythm. So for me, usually the first communication is much, much bigger. It's like a kickoff. It's a lot of new information. Second communication is smaller. This is things to remember from the first part and what changed, an update. Next time is also overall framework and an update. And every time you shorten the first part of repetition and you improve and make bigger the second part, which is like new stuff and updates. And it always should be adapted to the audience. So repetition is key here and repetition on specific time intervals. That really, really helps me. And I have different things like newsletters for, I don't know, C-level meetings for the team and then slides for the entire company. And I have different mediums and at different cadences. So over time, I just adapt it slightly. And that, that's my communication strategy. And to add quickly to Thank that, you. I'll, give, I'll give an example. We had uh, so a couple of years ago, we were creating competency assessment within the performance review product. Um, and it was a big kickoff because it was a big project. Um, there was a lot of representatives from sales, from pre-sales, and then the customer, customer success management. Um, so my peer, another GPM and I, um, given that company has grown at that point, and I, we were in the same boat as you, Patricia, because we there's like so many channels, um, and we were trying to kind of gather lessons from the previous projects. Um, what worked well, I'll tell you. So we've created in a way um, a working manual. So as Daniel mentioned, there was a kickoff and in the kickoff we said, okay, so they said the communication channels we're gonna be using. 
Um, this is the cadence. So it's really like a working manual for this specific project. And you post it, we use Slack. So we post it and pinned it in a specific focused channel for this project. So if someone wanted to see like, oh, when is the next communication comes out, they could do it. Um, number two, um, right off the bat, the actual presentation and kind of like the outcomes we were looking for the competency assessment, we delivered over Loom. So Loom really became my go-to tool uh, for short videos where I can't get 20 people in the same meeting because, you know, different time zones, um, people have different priorities, but this one is important. So we really recorded a 10 minutes presentation and started soliciting um, questions and people loved it. They loved it. They, they could watch it in their own time. They kind of still um, understood because, uh, you know, it wasn't the written communication. It was still very, in a way, personal. And there was, you know, obvious reactions that you can live with Loom. But also that kind of set the precedence to, hey, we're going to start creating more of a synchronous communication. And this is another example of working manual with us. And of course, you know, with the sales, we would say this is when we would send you through the Slack. Um, we would have the actual meeting with you every two weeks to go over the slide deck. Um, so you're really creating kind of like a, a schedule, um, we call it manual, and then so that everyone is on the same page. Because in my experience, once you get that alignment, everyone knows where to go to find something out. And when something comes out, um, a lot of questions just disappear to that because it's much more predictable in that way. Thank you so much. Good tips. So if I can add something, Patricia, to that, I also <clears throat> was in the, I'm in the same situation. I'm still hand because I'm still like with the communication takes a lot of time. But since two months, more or less, uh, I loved the fact that Slack introduced vocal messages and video messages directly on chat. And uh, yet in my company, not so many people are using it, but I'm a huge fan. And it's making me saving so much time, especially when it's like a lot of things that I have to explain. I just send a vocal message or a video uh, screen directly from Slack and it's being a life saving. Maybe when I feel like when I feel uh, gentle, I also like write a message with like in the minute in which I answer to specific things. So I give some kind of index. It's not something I do every time, but when it's, for example, uh, four, five minutes vocal message, then I do it. Um, so yeah, that's for me has been a lifesaver. <laughs> nice, good one. I think we being mindful of time should wrap up pretty soon. So here's this last slide. Please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. And this is a link to my profile and to Katya's. We're super, if you have questions, just ask away. If you want to follow us, we also blog on LinkedIn about product issues and how we resolve them, share some news from our practice. And if you want to participate in the program, here is the link to the website. You have a discount, check it out. If you want to learn more about this complexity framework and develop a better, like a stronger skill to apply it, we are super helpful. Uh, we would love to help you. And we have a couple of spots left for a cohort that starts in the last week of February, which is two and a half weeks from now, I think. Cool. Thank you so much. I don't see other questions. So um, yeah, uh, just again, I want to thank uh, you, Daniel and Katya for uh, being our guest tonight and uh, very interesting uh, insights. And uh, yeah, also to everyone for participating. I'm also leaving my LinkedIn in case someone is interested to be a speaker for next time. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much. Have a very nice evening. Nice evening. Bye, everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye.